of uh, Trouble in B, but also since I'm stage directing in here, I thought we could also do any Q&A any, any folks have about uh, about the season, uh, getting through the pandemic, uh, programming, and, and all that sort of stuff. How many here have already seen this production? Not this year. <laughs> 1968. 1968, yeah. Um, great, so, so some have seen it, some haven't. Um, yes, I was going to say, uh, this is technically a premiere for a college light opera, though Ursula uh, pointed out or reminded me the other day that uh, this was 68, right? This was on 68. the 68. 68. Uh, My first summer in the box office when I was 14. Ursula's first summer <laughs> at Mogul and Gilbert and Sullivan, which was their final season, yes, before yes. Uh, College Light Opera Company was founded uh, the following year in 69. So it's an interesting little piece of history with this. Piece. Uh, at that time, it was produced uh, as a double bill with uh, The Devil and Daniel Webster, yes. was, right? It's the other... Um, by Douglas Moore. By Douglas Moore, right. Uh, this evening's production is just Trouble to TV, uh, the one act. Uh, and that was part of our plan this summer with, uh, with COVID and with the pandemic. We intentionally tried to choose shows that would not require intermissions. Uh, because if we all remember back <laughs> only a few months ago, we weren't even sure if we would have live theater. We were trying to do everything in our, uh, our ability to create uh, short shows that would allow for uh, convenient social distancing and um, not promote mingling on the patio. So when things did open up, which was, I believe, two weeks before the students actually arrived on campus, uh, two weeks before they arrived, we actually knew we could do theater, and um, it also opened up fairly quickly, as you all remember, after that. And uh, we started to reinstitute some of the intermissions, but really, if, if you know this piece or when you see it, you realize there's no place uh, to put an intermission, and in many ways, an intermission would be detrimental to the way the piece is written. Um, one of the ways that uh, Bernstein wrote this piece is, uh, it's sort of a, a cacophony, of, uh, in a good way, I think, <laughs> but a cacophony of sound that builds and builds and builds and builds until there's this moment uh, in, the, in scene seven, the final scene, where the music just drops out and you have a brief dialogue <coughs> and your ears have been so accustomed to the, to the music and the sound that it's that experience that I think we're all familiar with where silence sort of rings in your ear uh, I, I think it's a very incredible dramatic effect that, that he used there. And uh, so that's, that's one of the reasons why breaking it with an intermission would be strange. Um, you'll also notice, if uh, you haven't seen it or you haven't looked, that this is a five-person show. There are only five singers in this opera, because it is an opera, although it is very uh, jazzy. Um, there are, are two sort of main characters who are uh, Sam and Dinah, who are a married couple, uh, 10 years into a marriage, uh, struggling with sort of the typical things that happen 10 years into a marriage. And then the other three singers in the piece are what is actually described in the, in the score itself as a, I believe the quote is, a kind of Greek chorus born of the radio jingle or the radio commercial jingle. And uh, so what you'll notice there is you have three singers, you have a uh, baritone, a tenor, and a soprano, who create uh, a very uh, tight sort of, um, you know, uh, jazz trio, if you will, with very tight harmonies, who kind of guide us through the evening. And a lot of their text, if you listen to it, is uh, it's a little um, not uh, not nonsense, but it's a lot of products and things to buy and things that are happening, which is a way that uh, that he sets up this world that we're in, the early fifties of hyper consumerism. You know, we're coming off of 
uh, World War II, uh, there's a lot of prosperity, a lot of things to buy, a lot of general noise going on, and that is the backdrop in front of which we see uh, the stru human struggle between this married couple. Uh, and in my opinion, there's, there's a commentary there about uh, the noise of uh, media. In, in that day and age, the, the television, the radio, uh, magazine media, that uh, sort of drowns out the personal interactions that we all should be having or should be concentrating on. And uh, there's this, uh, a lot of ex, you know, unattainable expectations that are placed on us by media, especially by commercials, uh, that create expectations for spouses. You know, the husband should be this, the wife should be this, the home should look like this, and if it isn't like that, something's wrong. So if something is wrong, you don't talk about it because that indicates there's something wrong and it's sort of a snowball effect. Uh, what I found very interesting in working on this production with uh, our students here at the club, you know, they're all uh, in their early 20s. So they've grown up at this point with social media. And I think you can draw a very direct line between the struggles that you see in Trouble in Tahiti with the struggles that a lot of folks have today with, with social media, which also sets up this expectation and uh, this, you know, is, it, is this picture good enough for Facebook? Is this picture good enough for Instagram? No, do we take enough? Oh, that, well, no, your, my hair wasn't quite right there. Or I really wanted to get the car in the background on that picture. Or, you know, the new washing machine is, is out of focus. But uh, if I were looking at, so one of my thoughts as a stage director with this piece originally was, gosh, it'd be great to update it, to do it, you know, do a, a contemporary version of it. But when you start to look at the material, it is uh, incredibly tethered to the early 50s. It, it sounds like that, it, it reads that way, the characters are there, if you pull it out of that world, uh, it, it becomes something else. And it distracts, I think, from the, from the internal message of the piece. So it was important to us to keep it uh, in, the early, in the early 50s when it was, uh, when it was written. Um, and in the original production and in, in the descriptions of, in the uh, libretto, it states that the scenery should be very cartoony, <coughs> very flat, very kind of uh, you know, almost beatnik you know, interpretive. And my opinion is that was intended to give you that extra degree of separation. So if you were watching it <coughs> in 52, 53, you would have said, okay, I'm, I'm watching a presentational version of life so I can look at it critically. You know, it's <coughs> sort of an old theatrical trick. You know, you, you make it a little bit fake, then people feel more comfortable looking at it. Uh, put in our context today, of 2021, we design-wise thought it was important to try to go hyper-realistic with the furniture. So uh, we spent a lot of time uh, shopping and looking for the right coffee pot or the right uh, you know, settee for the living room to make us feel like we were in that world of the, uh, of the early 50s. Because from our perspective, something in the 50s is itself a lens of separation for us. So we can look at that critically and say, okay, well, this isn't me, this is someone else. But of course, theater always does that to you. It, it tricks you into looking at yourself through the lens of, of a different situation. Um, this is a, uh, not a comedy. Uh, which is important to maybe say for anyone who's, who, who hasn't done their homework and is about to sit down. Uh, I wouldn't say it's a tragedy either. I would say it's a, a drama. Uh, and it does require, uh, in my opinion, a little active thinking. Um, it doesn't spell things out as, as much as, as some of the other productions do this summer. Uh, and that was also important for us on the staff to put this title on, uh, on the, the docket. It gives a nice sort of palate cleanser. Uh, you know, we're, we're just coming off of Pajama Game, 
we're going into Wizard of Oz, and right in between is Trouble Indeed. So uh, it's, a, it's a big uh, change in, in style, change in mood, but it's been really interesting to work with the company on it. Many of them uh, have said this is their favorite project because it's a lot of stuff that they could dig their, their teeth into. A lot of conversation uh, had to be had into uh, how to approach these two characters. Well, the, the trio as well, but especially uh, Dinah and Sam. To uh, married people in a relationship with a son, Junior, whom we never meet. He is referenced a lot. There are, there are signs that Junior is somewhere, but it's kind of that um, uh, children should not be seen or heard, and <laughs> he's just nowhere. Uh, but they are struggling at the root. They're struggling with communication. It's a, a breakdown of communication. They don't know how to talk to each other. And you'll notice that the, uh, the trio, or the Greek chorus, is commenting on that at certain parts, especially when we get into scene seven. So they have the pre the trio has the prelude and they have the interlude, sort of their, their big numbers, and then uh, scene seven. In the prelude and in the uh, interlude, there is just a lot of talk about suburbia and the suburban life and everything you need and the up-to-date kitchen and the colorful bathroom and the bone chinaware and the silver and it, it goes on and on and on. Uh, and then they get to scene seven, the final scene, and the trio shifts, and they tell us all about uh, the evenings at home, and the firelight, and the intimate matters, and the time for couples to talk. This is the time where you're, you know, if you think of those sort of Norman Rockwell pictures of, you know, you know sitting around and discussing intimate matters, and that is in stark, juxtaposition to what's actually happening in the living room where you have a couple seated as far apart as they can be, legs crossed away from each other, one reading the newspaper, one reading the magazine, and they are not even looking at each other. They're not discussing anything. Uh, and that is, uh, that's at the core of what Trouble in Tahiti is about, uh, as well as uh, escapism and how we escape from difficult situations in our own lives that we don't want to address. And so you have two options. You have Dinah, sort of the frustrated uh, housewife who finds escape in the movies. So she goes to see a matinee of a, a movie called Trouble in Tahiti, where we get the title of the piece. Uh, and one of, or probably the most famous uh, songs from the piece, which is What a Movie. She sings about it. And the whole point of the, her song, supposedly, is that it's a horrible movie, but then she tells us the entire plot of the movie, and she gets so into it that the chorus is dragged into it as backup singers, and until she finally breaks out of it and says, a horrible, terrible movie. Uh, so that's her place where she can escape, whereas Sam, the husband, the father, he escapes into this world of sort of hyper-masculinity at, uh, at work and at the job, at, at the gym. So <coughs> sort of, you know, that kind of, you're a winner or you're a loser. You, you, you buy things, you sell things, and then you go and you play sports, and you win a trophy, and it's, you know, I'm the winner, you're the loser, and there's nothing in between. Uh, and that's sort of his escape. Uh, and something that I find very fascinating about Sam, the way it's written, in his uh, aria, uh, which is there's a law about men, and you see, you know, there are winners, there are losers, it's all winners and losers, and one of the lines is, uh, the winner never has to worry uh, about his dinner. You know, in other words, like, he's always provided for. The next time we see Sam, which is very quickly after that, he's sort of coming home with his tail between his legs, he's missed Junior's play, he has his trophy, and he cannot open the doorknob because he knows he's gonna go in to dinner where he's going to face what he's done during the day. So it's this very interesting thing where just moments before, it's all bravado, all out there, all masculine, and only two seconds later, he's just trying to creep into the house, hiding his trophy, the one thing that he's the most proud of, uh, and just trying to sort of slip in the back door. Uh, 
and there are a lot of moments like that, I think, in this in this piece that are written very, very, uh, in a clever way, but a very sensitive, quiet way. And they just sort of creep in there. It's, it's the sort of piece that the more you spend with it, the more time you listen or you see it, you always find little pieces uh, uh, in it. As well as musical quotations, which are kind of fun in this piece. Um, he quotes himself uh, in the lines of Verbia, which is the same as New York, New York. Uh, and also there's a moment uh, which sounds very much like um, um, uh, help. Hmm? Valley High, thank you. Yes, Valley High. Um, so uh, if you're thinking Rogers and Hammerstein, you know, Trouble in Tahiti, uh, it's, it's not a direct uh, lampooning of South Pacific, but it's close. You know, it's, it's, it's that spectacle, almost absurdly uh, colorful representation uh, that was very popular in the sort of big, overly produced uh, musical movies. Um, there's also a sort of half quote of any "Get Your Gun" um, with the with the line um, "Who could ask for anything more?" But it's a little bit. It's who could ask for anything. It's it's a little different musically, but it's in there. And it, this is I think five or six years after "And Get Your Gun," so people it would have been in your consciousness. You would have heard it like, "I get what you're doing." Uh, and I think also the way the trio sounds does sound just like a radio trio. So if you remember all of those jingles from the 50s and 60s, that's what he's playing with. And so what we've done in this production is created what I call um, it's sort of a, a radio overture, if you, if you will. So before we actually start the music of Trouble in Tahiti, there's about eight minutes of uh, radio jingles. So the trio comes out early and they do a series of vintage jingles from the time of the piece, uh, as well as advertisements. Just to kind of remind all of us, like, oh right, that was the world that was, act that was the actual world that this piece was written in. So this all would have sounded very familiar to everyone watching. Um, the piece was not very well received initially, uh, but it became more popular uh, later on. As I understand, uh, sort of, I guess, urban legend is of, of the first performance of it. Uh, it was, I think Brandeis University uh, was where the first performance was, and it was part of a, a sort of day-long festival that kept getting longer and longer, and this was the last piece on the festival, and again, if you've seen Tahiti or you know it, it's not the piece you want to end the night on, because uh, people are just going to be like, "What are you just doing?" Um, which is another reason why I think you know it has to be a one act. You know, you could not sit through this couple for another act. <laughs> one act of those folks is enough to be like, "Okay, I get what's happening." Here. Um, oh, you'll all, I mean, you'll also notice. Well, I mentioned already, but you'll. Uh, be aware, it is five people, and we don't add anyone to it. So it's only five of our, our singers are in this uh, production. Um, so the, the rest of the company have had this week off to either recoup or prepare for what's coming down uh, the pike for them. Uh, and also provided a, a very different opening night this week, where we had more company members in the audience than we did <laughs> on the stage. But, uh, I think that was a lot of fun for, for everybody. Performing. Um, does anyone have questions? Uh, and they could be questions either about this production or questions about the season or the clock in general. First of all, Oz is next week, right? How are you? Are you shortening that somewhat? Or? So, the, yeah, it's um, so it's the Muni Wizard of Oz, which means that uh, do not be surprised. The music is all the music we love. The book is much closer to the original children's book. So the plot is not the same as what we know as the movie, but all the songs are the same. So, uh, I mean, the plot is, is similar, and like the, the same important things happen, but in a different, uh, slightly different way. Um, it has been trimmed down a little bit, but that 
show itself is actually quite a short um, series here. Um, but I do think they, they cut out some of the, there are a lot of dances uh, in that show, so they've, they've cut down on some of the dances. The jitterbug is still in, if anyone's <laughs> interested or worried about that. We'll see the jitterbug. But some of the other dances have been, have been shortened. Is there a chance that next year we'll be back to normal? <laughs> that's, I, that's a great question. I mean, I think the, the first question there is what is normal now? Um, but the second question is, uh, that's just to qualify to say yes, in the sense that we will be back to a uh, full company, yeah, we will be back to bigger production. Yeah, so that's the plan. We do, the release that right now we're anticipating uh, keeping curtain at 7.30, um, because that seems to be working pretty well for most people. I know some people aren't thrilled with it, but the majority of folks seem uh, happier with that time. We're gonna also uh, give the second matinee another year to sort of settle in because it takes time for for people to adjust to that. Um, so uh, that's a long way of saying yes, back to normal. Um, the orchestra will be back? The orchestra will be back, oh, yep, okay. yes. Um, so we'll have our, our orchestra back, we'll have our singers back, uh, we'll have our design and production team. We're very, very low on, uh, which we may not have noticed because they're, they're working extremely hard, but um, we're very low on design and production students this year. Mm -hmm. yeah, good well, we, we commend you for going along and going because Thanks. Yeah. 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 I proposed the second matinee. And yeah. So was, what were the principal reasons for that? Was one to accommodate the large number of older people? Well, the it's, you know, it's something that... Um, people the rest on Thursday night. Or, yeah, and uh, Leonors can speak to this as well. It's, it's been, I mean, ever since I've been associated. The matinee was always the best selling. Right. And, I, and ever since I've been here, and, and I know long before I was even a twinkle in anyone's eye, I think it was a conversation about, is it possible? And when COVID happened, and when we had to take last year off from live performances, Joan, Beth, and I had a long conversation. We said, you know what, we have to do so many things differently this is really a great time to just try it because we're having to move so many things around. One more thing is not, you know, is not gonna muddy the water any more than everything else is. So and also the Thursday night performances were not selling well because of everything else going on in town. Yeah, so it's, it's um, <coughs> when you think about it now, we still have six performances, but you've got a Tuesday night, you've got a Wednesday night, Friday night, and Saturday night. So you have uh, four evenings, two of which are smack in the middle of the week, two of which are on the weekend. So you've kind of got that covered. And then you have two matinees during the week. So people who are matinee folks have two options, whereas it's not as it used to be. That's your one opportunity for a matinee during the week. If you can't make that, then that's it. So, or you um, can't get tickets. Or you, well, yeah, you can't get tickets, but also you know, you'd have folks, you remember the source, who, who were matinee goers, they couldn't make their matinee, and say, well, well, why don't you come Wednesday night? They said, well, I don't drive at night, I can't do the night. So now it's, if they can't make the Thursday matinee, they can do the Wednesday or vice versa. Um, and it's also interesting this year with the streaming option because uh, if folks do miss their night, or if they're still not comfortable being in the theater, which a lot of folks are not, uh, they can still participate, which was very important to us. Um, for this year. I will say, because just because a lot of folks have been asking if we're gonna continue uh, streaming next year, uh, probably not in this, at least not in this iteration, and the reason for that is uh, rights and royalty houses. Uh, if we were to promise that we could stream all nine shows, we would, for example, never be able to do Roger and Hammerstein, because mm -hmm. Roger and Hammerstein, you cannot stream. So it would really tie our hands as far as the titles that we would be uh, able to do. Uh, that said, now that we have done it, and we know how much of a headache it is, and how less of a headache it is, uh, I'm hoping that we'll be able to uh, offer something in the world of like three or four possible streaming options. Um, because it's proved very popular with parents. You know, a lot of our, our company members come from the West Coast or somewhere else, and their, their family can't get to the kids. And this has been incredible, because some of them, you know, as soon as they're 
their son or daughter got in the company, they, they booked a streaming subscription and they've been watching religiously every week from wherever they are. So it's been a really great way to keep their folks connected. And it's also been really popular with alums around the country. You know, it's a bit of nostalgia for them. You know, some of them haven't been back to the high field since they were here, and they get to kind of have that experience uh, virtually. Mm -hmm. Yes? Yeah. Last, last summer, you had uh, off the clock where you were able to look at some student performances, some, you know, member performances, some orchestra, and then some background. Um, and I, I found it I interesting to, to do all of them, but in particular, the actors, mm -hmm. it, it's really nice to be able to see them because only one night do you really get to meet them after the performance, but it was so nice to see them personally and, and just do a little thing so that you got to feel like you know who was, who was performing. And right. I figured that, that could be continued, even if it's one of their audition things yeah. or something. Well, I'll let you in on a little secret. It's not secret, but it sounds more exciting if I say it's a little secret. Um, they are, this summer, they're in the process of recording uh, sort of what you would call be, be real or, you know, um, stuff for, for holidays during the year. So they'll be, throughout the fall, winter, and spring, we'll be releasing little videos that they're making now um, that will feel like those off the clock uh, videos, a little bit more intimate, uh, you know, song for Valentine's Day or for Christmas or, or Easter or whatever. So we'll have a connection with Clock Aurea. Exactly, yeah. I mean, it, it'll have been stuff recorded now, but it'll feel like it's yeah. a connection. State Opera before it disbanded, uh -huh. um, commissioned someone to do a wraparound. And what they did was uh, another 45 minutes of pre moment of trouble Tahiti. So you saw the characters when they were younger, uh -huh. and how they met, yep. and then how they married, yep. and where, how they got to <coughs> the point of trouble Tahiti. Where they are, and um, it was done in the same kind of um, 1940s, 1950s music. Mm -hmm. and, but it was fascinating to see the evolution of the characters, mm -hmm. and then when that rap finished, trouble Tahiti went, and right. it was like, oh, you yeah. know, you could see the whole um, yeah, evolution. yeah. It, that's it is one of the challenges with this piece. Yeah. Is you, you're you jump right in, like the first, aside from the trio telling you kind of where when we are, you jump right into the the morning fight in the kitchen, and you're like. Okay, and it's like <laughs> you like strap your seatbelt the whole time. Like, Here we go. Yeah, yeah. It was an amazing. It made it an opera that you could buy into right. and get your full money's worth. Right, right. <laughs> so to speak. Yeah. So, but it was very interesting to see. Yeah, it's a good word. Last summer's construction is that all wrapped up? Oh, good question. Thank you. Uh, it's very nearly there. We're missing a couple of railings at the moment, um, which I'm told has to do with COVID, and uh, you know, I just I believe what I'm told. <laughs> uh, did, it all on COVID. <laughs> I, at this point, right. but the the railings are, and I I have to say, Valley Group has been amazing. The fact that the building was. You know, aside from the railings, the building was off by maybe a week on the schedule, and that was a schedule set pre-COVID. It's pretty incredible. Um, the nice thing is that we've been able to use it, so I would say kind of at 60% of what we would be normally using it. So we're using the main uh, rehearsal hall, which is the, the primary purpose of it, and we are not using uh, a lot of the offices and spaces that are sort of go around the rehearsal space. Uh, so it's been a really nice res res resource for everybody. And it's been kind of interesting having it this year with a smaller company, we've been able to sort of lightly get into how that building fits in with campus life and um, you know, figuring out what the challenges are, and what works best, and which spaces are, are better for what kind of rehearsal. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, it's, it's very, very nearly there. 
Well, it's going to add, understood from perhaps in one of these talks that the idea of not having the whole company in every performance was related to the intensity of the work on everybody, given the small number of people. But I guess on the positive side, it gives those three or typically two or three mm -hmm. a ch chance to prepare even longer for their new role in the next show. Do right. you contemplate doing something like that, or are you going to return to where well, the education of the kids for participation the whole summer? It's a it's a conversation we're having right now, and I'm I'm not sure where it's going to land because there are a lot of benefits to it, and not too many. Uh, there are a couple of negatives, but not too many negatives. And one of which, well, an expected negative was well, if they're you know, if they're not in trouble in Tahiti, they're not going to get that experience of working on trouble in Tahiti. But we found that that's really not the case because when you're on campus, you cannot help but kind of be engrossed in what's happening, whether it's your show or not. So they still get that exposure to it, even if they're not uh, active participants in the production. Um, so it's definitely something that we're we're having a conversation about. It becomes a little more complicated when you go back to the full the full numbers. Mm -hmm. um, that said, you know the high field is a small stage, and when you have thirty-two of them up there, and then there's like a big piece of scenery, it's like, oh, they're really crammed up there trying to do that kick line. But um, so we'll, you know, we'll, we'll see. It's, it's definitely something that staff is, is discussing. And uh, at the beginning of the summer, we were very clear with all the uh, directors and, and music directors to say, uh, you know, keep track of things that that you like, the surprises that you find are working better or, or things that aren't, and let us know at the end, because this is kind of a forced experiment for us. So we would never have done this were it not forced upon us, but now that we're in it, we might as well learn from it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, hand in glove with them, because are you going to go back to auditioning for roles, or are you going to precast? Because if you precast, then you can cut the numbers and all that good stuff. It, well, yeah, that's, and that's all exactly hand in glove. So that's part of that ongoing conversation. What's, what we did this year, which worked very well, but again, was specific to this year, was uh, Beth and I cast the principal roles, and then for the sort of secondary, tertiary ensemble roles, we kind of said, this is the gang that you've got for that show. Here are their audition videos, and you can you know, shuffle them the way you want to. And sort of unsurprisingly, some people did their shuffling and some people didn't, so then we had to shuffle for them. But uh, they had the option to shuffle them. Uh, so that was, that was interesting and worked well. And uh, you know, the, the good thing is if, they, you know, if you know you're going to be um, Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz, then you can start working on that earlier. That said, even though someone knows that they're going to be something, doesn't necessarily, they're going, you know, a procrastinator is always a procrastinator, so just because someone tells you that it's happening, uh, doesn't mean that you can actually do the do prep. Given the Zoom and remote auditions, what are some of the surprises you encounter, positive and negative? Because hearing kids over that little speaker and yeah. seeing their personalities must be very different. Mm -hmm. It is. I, I, I can't say that there's any negative. Uh, I think, this, for me, it's always like, oh, I didn't realize you were that tall. Or it's like, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's the that screen kind of thing. Um, and what was nice this year, so usually what happens, in case people don't know, is they submit an audition reel where there are requirements that they, that they have to fulfill, and that's the reel that we look at, and from that we make all of our decisions. Uh, with the caveat that if there's sort of competing people, then we go to look at references and other things. Uh, and that is, that's it. This year we had, that was our initial round, and then we went on to second and third rounds as we pared them down. And those second and third rounds were live Zoom auditions, which meant that Beth and I could actually interrupt act with them. So even though it was on Zoom, we could still say, oh, stop, you know, could you do this again, but think more lyric? Could you do that scene again and, and remember that she's not angry, she's sad, or, you know? And that was a really wonderful opportunity for us to learn how they 
take notes, which is one of the more important things. Not necessarily what you show up with in the room, but how quickly can you chameleon into something else when given a note, or do you just stick with, you know, do you do the, the line exactly the same way, even though you've been given a note that's, that's leading you to try to do it a different way? Uh, so that's something that I feel, although it did take a lot longer, uh, at the end of the day, it was incredibly beneficial because we, we kind of knew, and we also knew who in the company was going to need some more, you know, attention. So we could give the stage directors a heads up and say, you know, this person's really great, but they're they're a little bit slow to, to get things learned. So you may need to pay a little bit more attention. Or you know, this person is very quick, so you can rely on them. And you're not going to have to. to spend all that much time, and when you're trying to put a show up in one week, that kind of information is priceless, and you can plan it in. So I feel like we're, for better or for worse, I think we're gonna be, you know, that's gonna be a big part of my winter, <laughs> call that. Great, any other questions? Yeah. Throughout the whole digital season last year, some of these students, when they performed, they have perfect backgrounds and lighting and, and uh, clothing and focused cameras and yep. everything. And, and some of them didn't. Yes. <laughs> and do you guys coach them on that? Or do their schools coach them on that? Or, or? Well, well, both. I think it's, uh, I mean, there's a couple of uh, factors to unpack in there. I think one of, one of them is, what is this for you? And how are you, in, what do you think of this? Is this a performance or is this sort of a casual thing? What they do get coached on in, in school, and we also talk to them about, is how you prepare a, a reel, you know, a, a video of yourself, and, and all those things become important, the lighting, the clothing, the background. Um, in Digital Clock, we had a lot of conversations about um, you know, things being casual and feeling at home versus uh, versus not feeling uh, that way, and they were really left to their own devices to, to make those choices, and um, that was interesting. Some of them made very strong choices in one direction, and some of them made very strong choices in the other direction. It was also the same in callbacks. It was interesting to see which of them you know had a very clean space set up, and which of them were okay with their laundry on their bed in the background <laughs> you know, after they were in the callback. You can look at any of the pieces that Julia did, for example, and you can say, this is the person I'd like to hire. Right, and right. And you can look at some of the other ones and say, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, yeah. But you know, and that said, um, reminding yourself that uh, when you are, you know, when they are a performer, they are not responsible for the set or their clothing. It's a different department that will dress them and, right. and give them a bed that doesn't have laundry on it. Back and forth, but but I, I think at the crux of that is it's a very important skill that becomes more and more important as we're, we become more uh, accustomed to to Zoom and the, the digital age that we live in. That if you are a performer, you need to be able to put together uh, a high quality video of yourself at very short notice. So you'll find more and more of them. You know, I think for Christmas and birthdays, are asking for ring lights and and uh, other you know, cameras rather than something else. That, it, this is a footnote, that issue was a very important one in the case of the education community. Mm -hmm. You had people, professors who were you know, well known for the drama and the way they delivered their lecture, mm -hmm. but were completely incompetent and losing <laughs> <laughs> and no skills. And, right, I was involved for a whole year in an organization that mm -hmm. presented lectures by professors. Yeah. And we had to go 180 degrees oh, and, yeah. and coach every single one of them about mm -hmm. the lighting and the background mm -hmm. and their clothes and the environment in which they're presenting, mm -hmm. also on very short notice. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we all kind of went 0 to 60 very quickly. Uh, you know, some of us quicker than <laughs> others, but, uh, you know, it's, it, now we know. We all should know how to use it. And it, it is very convenient, and it, it makes life a lot easier, and uh, it's definitely with us to stay, um, so we, you know, we need to get used to it. Even after a year and a half, people 
Okay, so selective, like 16. Yep. Did you have to look? I'm just curious how many were not selected. Uh, you must have looked at an awful lot of videos. Yeah, I mean, I think the initial round was just under 300 applicants. Okay. And then we winnowed that down to between 50 and 60, I think, who were in the callback pool. Uh, and then from that, we got maybe, let's say we, we, we were pretty sure of like 11 or 12 of them. And then there was, you know, four or five that we had to go back and do like another round or two to, to, to tie it up. And then there, inevitably, you think you have everything tied up and then one of them gets another offer, drops out, and then the whole wheel starts turning again. Um, but that, that happens no matter what. Is that a typical size of your pool over the years? <laughs> I'd say so, yeah. Um, yeah, that's pretty pretty normal. It was, uh, you know, it, it was growing pre-pandemic and took a bit of a dip, you know, by maybe 20 or 25 um, this year, but I, I expect- I'd say we always had 300. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's about right. Great, well, enjoy the show, everyone. Thank you.